Hey everyone, before we start the show, a quick word from our sponsor, the American Nurse Association. This is a professional community that, that has helped us both when we were nursing students and now professional nurses. It has a ton of great resources and news for all nursing professionals. Listen up nurses and nursing students, summer is here and summer is a perfect time for you to brush by your nursing skills. And that is exactly why the American Nurses Association is offering 25% off their courses, workshops, books, and their whole website. Use code SUMMERSALE21 at checkout for your discount. Go to nursingworld.org to get all the latest information there or click the link in the description to find out about the sale. Don't forget, sale ends September 6th. You don't want to miss out. Happy studying. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another Knowledge Packed episode with your hosts, Peter and Matt. This is the Cup of Nurses podcast. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and taking the time to listen. We really do appreciate that. For anyone that's new, you will not be disappointed. Those that are returning, if you find any value in this podcast, please give us a five-star like, comment, subscribe, share with loved ones. This is how we grow. This is how we get motivated. And this is how we can keep on producing this high-quality content. Cupofnurses.com and wearfrontlinewares.com for anything related with updates, announcements, merch. Check out the Facebook groups. Sign up to our newsletter. We have a ton of things. We're always growing and expanding, especially this summer. We really took advantage of our time being away from nursing. So tune in and hang out with us. How you doing, Pete? I'm doing amazing. Episode 127, we are going to talk about some of our favorite accesses in the ICU, those being central lines, the placement process, management, what to expect, and some of the complications and also the benefits of central lines. Especially as an ICU nurse, when we get a patient from the ER and that person does not have a central line and they're on pressors or they look like their patient or their blood pressure is unsteady, something's about to happen, yeah, as ICU nurse is going to be upset. I mean, central lines are clutch. It's, they're so much better than, than, perif- than peripheral lines. Like probably A-line is probably my favorite line. And then it goes probably central lines. And then, you know, you could say peripherals or, or whatever, because central lines are clutch. You could give any kind of medication in there. You could, you know, have them placed at bedside. You don't have to go very far to, 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 to get them done. And a lot of times it's very helpful in life-saving measures, especially during, during a code central line or any other kind of line. Because peripherals, you know, during a code situation, compression is going on, a lot of stuff is going on. Peripherals could get moved, pulled out by accident. Central lines are usually there to stay. And the reason why we like them so much in the ICU is emergent medications, things like vasopressors. Uh, you have different type of medications like TPN and just the list keeps on going that can be given peripherally. So this is where central meaning closer to the heart. This is how things are given here. So a central line is basically a catheter similar to, similar to like a peripheral line, except it's bigger and, and longer. And the tip rests in usually the right atrium, or it could be in one of the, the vena cavas, so a superior or inferior vena cava. And when they're being placed, usually it's placed by a physician or, or a PA or a nurse practitioner, intensivist. And as a nurse, your responsibilities during this, this placement process is usually going to be just monitor vital signs and help kind of set up the, the PA and the physician, the one that's going to inserting, they're going to be doing most of the work. It starts with a sterile environment. So you're going to drape the patient, probably lay him flat, wash the, the, the site with, with a proper you know cleanse. And then the physician is going to flush the line and then slowly start to insert it. And during that time, you could be the one actually that flushed the line and then he inserts or the usual physician might flush it themselves. But your main role is going to be to maintain patient maintain the patient status which is like keep them calm because it is a little bit of a of a painful procedure and it is invasive so your role is going to monitor vital signs and also stay with the patient trying to keep them calm the physician usually going to administer a little bit of lidocaine maybe some fentanyl some morphine depending on if the patient is, is intubated or or their their pain threshold and they're going to be the ones doing most of the work like i said your nurse is going to be monitoring and then you're going to be connecting your your pumps to, to that line once the insertion is done yeah, and if the patient is intubated, usually we crank up the pain medication a little bit, like the fentanyl or propofol, make sure they're sedated. They don't want to be moving around, especially when the, pa- when the doctor has a needle pointed at their neck or maybe a femoral that they're about to insert. Yeah. Uh, sometimes for the patients that are 
completely out of it because we usually get them in the ICU. What we do sometimes is we strain an arm. Mm. And we do that to help prevent the, the physician, especially the arm that is, uh, they, they usually restrain the opposite arm just so no one is fighting back because the physician will have the other arm. Usually the patient is restrained to begin with. Um, and prior to that, I just thought about it as consents. Mm. So there's two ways that consents are signed for the central lines. It's either the family or the patient is going to sign them or it's emergent. Yeah. Reason being is, especially in the ICU, if we have something happening that there's no time to contact family, reach out to them, we'll just override that consent based on emergency. Physician has that authority. We could go ahead and start. Another thing that usually happens for every single procedure that I feel like gets neglected is that timeout. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to kind of advocate too because you feel very intimidated mm -hmm. as a travel nurse seeing different physicians. Like you want to be like, all right, doc, like let's do a timeout. What patient is this? And they usually don't like doing that. Mm -hmm. I still try to verify, look at the consent forms if they have them, check the wristband and all that good stuff before we start the procedure. Yeah, one thing I failed to, to mention is during the insertion, um, during the procedure, when you're monitoring the vitals and looking at the monitor, sometimes you might get a little bit of like an atrial tickle when the catheter is, let's say, pushed in a little bit too deep and it you know touches the right atrium. Sometimes you might get some PACs or even some some PVCs with that, and that just signifies that you hit the hit the right atrium, and you should probably pull back because with like pick lines and, and central lines, usually the the tip of the lumen sits in, in the inferior or superior vena, vena cava, but if you have like a swan, then that's going to sit in the right atrium, right? So it's it's a little bit or actually not in the right atrium. You can have a port in the right atrium that's going to sit in, a, in the pulmonary artery. So that's a little bit more invasive. But for this episode, we're just sticking to like pick lines and central lines, not yeah. necessarily those more invasive swan gans catheters. Yeah, and also when it comes to the central line setup and insertion, the physician does most things, but you wanna set up the room for them. Mm -hmm. So I like to always unlock the bed, move it back a little bit so the physician has room there. I like to set up the monitor where it's facing the physician and also me when I'm titrating the medications. And usually blood pressures are, I would say either a Q hour or 15 minutes because mm -hmm. it's either I'm just doing it standard or I'm doing it every 15 minutes because I'm titrating medications for procedures like this maybe I'll do every Q5 mm -hmm. just because if I'm over sedating them I want to find out what's going on and so keep that in mind yeah and there's different types of brands you could say there's like the power pick the Hickman the Broviac and then the the Gross Hong and that just depends on what facility you work with and those lines are going to be kind of different but for the most part, for, for picks, I just usually see the purple power pick most commonly. Standard, yeah. Yeah. So just get familiar with, with those. We're not going to dive too deep into each specific brand and the positive or negatives, but just make sure you know what lines you're, you're working with. So we can probably start off with, with pick lines. Picks are a peripheral, peripherally inserted central catheter. So it's usually placed like in the arm, somewhere in the upper arm, like the basilic or, or cephalic vein, and then, then it gets threaded through that vein and it goes all the way to your your inferior vena cava, right? Or you could also place place central lines through your femoral, from your IJ, it depends. But usually the preferred route of a, of a pick is going to be in the upper arm where it's a little bit distant and also easy to, to access. Yeah, when it comes to picks, I've noticed that in most facilities, everything is standardized because mm -hmm. there's so much probability of getting collapses that there's usually a pick team. They'll come in, they'll do the insertion. You don't have to do anything. Most facilities I worked at, there's a pick team on call. You get a consent, call them, they come in, they place it. Um, and they even sometimes do dre dressing changes. Mm -hmm. Depends on what facility. Uh, when I worked more in a smaller hospital in my staff job in Chicago, we had to do dressing changes usually every single Wednesday because it was seven days and we did picks then and also the A-line uh, dressing changes, every, every anything else. And here where I worked in California, I've barely touched them because usually pick came in and and to change them mm -hmm. and i want to kind of take a step back because during covid we were changing those efforts a lot because there's always saturated blood because they're just leaking out from the um the heparin that they were getting in the uh, angiomax yeah so you might ask why do we need central lines why don't we use a, a peripheral because it's you could say less invasive and, and quicker some of the medication that we give in a hospital if they could be toxic to your vein and can't always be given through through a small exit, like a peripheral line, certain medications, certain antibiotics, certain chemo drugs can't be given. Uh, pressors, long-term wise, we don't want to give through those. Even electrolytes, 
like potassium, we don't want to always give through a peripheral. We prefer a central line a route as well. Matt mentioned uh, TPN and those lipids, they go through a central line. We also use it for long-term therapy too. Sometimes people go home with picks, like let's say there are a modulin for pulmonary hypertension that requires a pick if they don't have the pump or inotropes if they're in a heart failure and they're getting worked up for like an LVAD or a heart transplant and they need inotrope support to, to go home. Usually they get sent with a pick. Um, people that have cancer, usually they get the pick or the port. So central lines are very important and it's a lot better access than, than, than peripherals. And plus you don't have that risk for, for that, that peripheral line or a central line kind of migrating or getting pushed out of the vein and then just causing damage to the tissues. Yeah. And also you might be going home on long-term antibiotics. We can't leave you with a central line. Mm -hmm. And so we put a pick in. I've had that situation. I was younger mm -hmm. where I had, a. Uh, an infection and they didn't want to operate surgically after my appendix. So I just had a pick placed. By the way, man, that shit was gruesome. I was crying because at first the pick nurse came in and they did, they did it so different. They gave me some numbing medication. They started here with the AC. They kind of just started threading a wire through it and it was hurting so bad. They tried both arms when I was younger and I said, no, I can't do this. So then they took me downstairs to probably ir is what i'm thinking and that's when they kind of gave me some funny medications i remember as a child and the, the walls were moving and that's how they placed the pick in me yeah i never had a pick in me and hopefully i don't i don't ever have to pick in don't me. but next catheter we're going to talk about is the hd catheter the main difference between this and like the the pick lines is it's usually thicker um usually placed in subclavian or the ij depending on where the where the physician or np could get the access in and the main difference is, like I said, it's a lot thicker and it's kind of, you could say, Y-shaped. like the Because the, it has uh, two ports because you're doing a HD. So one port is pulling the blood out and the other one's getting getting the, the blood pulled back in. So it's, it's, it's like a Y, but the Y is inside your body instead of out, you could say. And as a nurse, you can tell which one is a central line versus a hemodialysis catheter. This is more, this is, episode is really more ICU because we don't, different nurses don't do those procedures. And also a lot of facilities, those hemodialysis catheters, they like those dialysis nurses like to wrap them. Mm. So they always put a couple of gauze and tape and you can differentiate which ones are which. Mm. Sometimes they'll put like a little piece of tape letting you know that, hey, there's heparin infused in that port. Make sure you don't flush it, uh, don't use it. And some of these hemodialysis ports also have a pigtail. That's a little bit different on, I don't know which manufacturers have them. What's cool about that pigtail actually works as a central line. Mm. So it's, it's a single lumen port and you could infuse like pressors or whatever with it, uh, depending on facilities. Again, it's going to vary. When I worked in Chicago, my place, we couldn't use the pigtail unless we had a physician's order. When I was working in Cali for the past two years, I mean, it was, I didn't have to ask anybody. I could draw blood and everything off the hemodialysis. Yeah. Catheter. Same. When I worked in Chicago, we were able to, if they had a pigtail, we could use the pigtail. But we're always told to never use the HD cath except for hemodialysis and in emergency situations. For example, if someone's coding and your peripheral access is iffy, then you can jump to the HD catheter because it's a life-saving measure. It's still going into, you know, your, your venous system and you're going to deliver that, that, that medication, right? So only in emergency situations. But besides emergency situations, don't touch those HD catheters because God forbid you mess something up, you... You know, it gets clotted because you forgot to flush it with heparin or something afterwards, and now the patient can't get HD, and now they're pulling it out and putting a new one in there, or the patient's, you know, dying because they can't get yeah. HD and they can't get access. And, and fun fact, maybe dialysis, usually th they do this, but maybe you're going to have a situation where they don't do this and you need to know to flush the ports with heparin. Mm -hmm. So usually with those catheters on the side of the port, you're going to see how much MLs to flush. I think it's 1.4, 1.3, don't quote me on that one, but that's how much mLs of heparin you need to infuse in, in every single port. Yeah. And then the difference between tunneled and untunneled, this is a little bit harder for a lot of newer nurses to kind of comprehend, but tunneled uh, catheters, they're used for longer durations and they're usually placed like in the, somewhere in the up, upper chest. And the main difference between, between tunneled and untunneled is the tunnel ones usually have something called a, uh, like a little anchor. Um, I forgot what it's called. It's like the thing that allows skin to overgrow on it. We were talking about it before the episode. It is called the cuff. The cuff. So basically the cuff, 
is only on tunnel catheters and this allows for tissue to get grown onto it so it anchors it in for long-term long-term therapy. I don't know that. And usually for non-tunnel, they let's say you're going through the IJ, you, you go straight into into the vein, right? For tunnel, you start at a different part of the body and then you feed it through into a vein. So it's a little bit, you could say, um, longer threading process, usually for the tunnel, but it allows, allows for long-term therapies compared to the non-tunnel route where it can get easy, it's more easily for it to get pulled out and it's more direct, you could say. Yeah, and anybody that gets that done goes to IR and has that done. Yep. Same thing with the ports. So ports, usually you'll see them on the top left side of the chest wall, and those are for long-term treatments, usually for cancer patients. Unfortunately, they have them. And uh, in order to access that, you need the special uh, Huber, Huber needles. To access I'm, I'm thinking of Dr. Huberman. And um, yeah, there's a special needle that gets punctured. I'm blanking um, out because I haven't been in. Yeah, there's a special We, we special didn't do needle. nursing for over two months, as yeah. funny as that sounds. So I'm kind of, I forgot a specific device. It's so funny. But that special needle that punctures the um, the ports. Yeah, I think it's there like was. A, it's like a hook. Yeah, there's a. I had a few patients with this where we were just able to access it through like a regular thin needle. Um, it wasn't a special needle, just need, maybe it was a special needle, but we had it on the unit and it didn't seem special to me. And you just, you just, you know, stick it in there and you inject it. Those are pretty cool. If you haven't seen a PowerPoint, a, like a power port or just like just a regular chemo port, they're actually really cool. They're literally underneath the skin. So you have, you, you have a less likelihood of infection, which is nice and less visual ability because all you really see is like a bump under the skin. And the one tricky part is with those, if they're multiple ports, you have to be careful because sometimes it's hard to feel where each port is. Yeah, I've had a lot of times in my previous place I had to go to different units as an ICU nurse and mm -hmm. insert them because they don't know how to do that, mm -hmm. uh, usually in the rural areas. So this needle is actually called the Huber needle and specially designed as a, it's a hollow needle that's used for accessing the port has a beveled tip and mm -hmm. it goes into the skin and through that silicone piece so it goes in through the reservoir yeah yeah that's so what it's called. so nice especially sometimes i see what you what you said those and they attach and then almost like a single lumen comes out of it and you can use that it's almost like a a single lumen central line it looks like after you hook, hook that up they have some they have some really cool adapters with those where you could literally use it as a central line and you could have um medication going on continuously just by having this adapter on there and it just looks like a literally like a like a central line just like one part coming out like a regular port that you would see with a central line and it's cool the, these these are hard to see sometimes and your patient won't tell you they have that and sometimes we place a central line in and then we look at the x-ray and we're just like oh what is that on the x-ray they There's got two of them there. they got a port man we didn't even need to ex do this access yeah because they are hard, hard to see and if they're coming in unconscious you know and sedated intubated you know from emergency you don't really really see it especially if it's been there for a long time it's really hard to visualize yeah especially in the er shout out to you guys and you guys are always busy and hustling there they don't have the time to completely undress and bathe and look at all the wounds so mm -hmm those things could be missed. Right, and with central line, we forgot to mention is the amount of pores they could have. It could be a single lumen, it could be a dual lumen or a triple lumen. And it's it's awesome because like a peripheral, you could run medications, but you, but you can't run a lot of them, right? Like you can't y site a lot of medication into peripheral because it's, it's just too small. But on a central line, there's been multiple times where I just had two accesses, which is a central line with two lumens, and I literally have four medications going into each port. Yeah. And there's no way you could put four medications into a peripheral line. So, so technically, if I have four meds going into each port, and it's two ports, I have eight meds running to a patient. I, I love no when I got to figure that, that out. Yeah. I love when I got to print out a giant chart of compatibilities mm -hmm. and medications. And then I go in my room, and it's cool because as an ICU nurse, every single shift, you figure out your access, what medications you're giving, and then you kind of reroute your mm -hmm. own medications usually because some people like to do things their own way. Yeah. Like there was a nurse that didn't know that propofol could go with like pressors, let's just say. She's like, I have never done that. Well, man, sometimes when you only have like a little lumen or two, you're pushing all your damn meds into one lumen. That includes propofol, fentanyl, mm -hmm. levo, epinephrine, you name it, just all gets busted into one. Right, yeah, especially with like sedation and your analgesics, right? A lot of nurses don't know that you could do fent, propofol, and verset all in one. Like that's, that's clutch, like sedation, all sedations are usually compatible with each other and analgesics and also all pressors are usually compatible with each other. The biggest ones that are incompatible with stuff is usually heparin and amiodarone. 
and sometimes like your your certain um anotropic yeah or i know with certain pulmonary hypertension medic medications you have to have just one single lumen dedicated to it just because it's it runs at a specific rate and obviously if you have different medication when you get different rates it's going to contribute to how fast it flows in the beginning but then the, then it evil evens out once everything gets gets um you could say leveled out yeah, and it gets super complicated too because usually sometimes you why say like insulin and heparin together and there's time sensitive medications where we're doing like ptt for coagulations and sometimes something has to get stopped or maybe something gets pushed you're running out of ports and that medication went in too fast that last 15 minutes 30 minutes your ptt is out of whack now now you gotta draw it every four hours or whatever mm -hmm. for angiomax those things were bad because those ptts were q2 when you had a bad when you when you weren't were in a therapeutic range and you had to do q twos when you got other stuff going on including CRT or another patient you're like damn yeah and also you could pull blood out of central lines which is which is wonderful you just have to make sure that you properly you flush especially if you have all those medications because like Matt said heparin heparin's a, a big one if you're taking if you have only that one access and you have heparin going through there you gotta be careful because if you don't flush it enough then you're going to get a abnormal PTT. But the thing with that is, is if you flush it too fast, you know, you might r raise a PTT for a little bit and you might make the patient bleed a little more. So you kind of have to be careful. But usually there's not a whole lot of CCs that, that fit into the, the the central line. It's what, like three maybe? It's Could not, be, yeah. There's not very Sounds much CCs in there. Like I said, it depends on the brand of your, of, your, of your central line. So it's something you should look into your unit. But, but yeah, you, just, you could draw blood off it and it's wonderful. You can draw blood, you could give meds, you, know, you could basically do a lot. It of gets complicated too when you have a uh, single strength levo, which is uh, 16 mics and ML, and then you get a quad strength levo, which is 64 mics and ML, and that just messes everything up because now you wise set it again, but your levo is running slower for that first 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So you better bump up those, the mics per, um, per hour just to catch up with, with everything else. And that's when the ice gets fun. If you have an, if you have an A line, you can see it and you could catch it. If you don't, maybe you could do uh, blood pressure readings more accurately or be more religious of checking because things can go down. Right. Yep. And of course, central lines are really are really good, but just with everything, there is some negatives with central lines. And the first complication wants to address is air embolism. I have never seen an air embolism in my life happen to to a patient. Knock on wood. But, you know, it does happen. You have to instill a lot of air, but still just be careful. And air embolism could happen upon insertion or it could happen when you're flushing. Maybe you have an empty syringe that you pulled back on, but never, you know, you could say flush and just a bunch of air in there. Ten seasons, if you instill 10 seasons of somebody in somebody, you're probably going to kill the patient. It's freaking mid air. air. That's, a, that's a lot. It's not a mid air. It's oh, that's, air air. that's what I should say. Yeah. <laughs> air air. So, yeah, be careful with those. Like I said, it's it, it can happen. I, it doesn't happen very often, but... You don't want to be the one causing an air embolism. So just be careful. So especially when we were younger in nursing school, we got told to watch out for these air bubbles. Um, honestly, just like you say, I've never seen an air embolism before either. Sometimes you'll have a little ML that'll go into the patient and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. yeah. But of course, be careful of that. The body can reabsorb uh, the air embolism air embolisms but things can happen yeah because what happens with air embolisms is it could travel to your brain to your lung or to your heart and it could literally stop the blood flow so you literally get a stroke an mi or you could literally go into respiratory failure and you, you code some of like the signs and symptoms you might see with an air embolism you're going to have difficulty breathing if it's respiratory related you might have chest pain heart failure muscle joint pain like i said stroke symptoms slurred speech vision changes mental changes Hypotension is probably the biggest one, and then you could cause cyanosis, which is like blue, bluish color of patient's fingertips or, yeah. or you know, their their skin, just because you're not getting enough oxygen in their, in their body. Another that sounds scary. Yeah, another complication can be infections. That's a huge one. Collapses like CMS has standards on them. Hospitals on your ass about sterile techniques and doing dressing changes every seven days. Mm -hmm. Some hospitals are really good at standardizing this, just like we mentioned, where they have a pick team or a central line team that changes those dressings. Mm -hmm. Usually it's up to the nurse, but of course with signs and symptoms for infections, watch out for fever, chills, temperature, tachycardia, hypotension, maybe some drainage and elevated uh, WBCs. Yeah. No, and, yeah. and sometimes with central lines in these crazy situations with patients with sepsis and stuff like that, we have to figure out what's happening. So 
there is times where we have to pull this central line because we have to culture it and we think it's a source of infection. There was many times where there was a patient with sepsis, they're on pressors, WBCs are elevated, we don't know why. We're checking sputum, we're checking urine, we're doing procal and all these tests and there's still something up. We might do a central line exchange. So they might put a fresh central line in or a pick from a central line depending on what's happening in the situation. And we're going to culture that pick line to see if that's the um, source of infection. And sometimes it is, which is wild. And with like cultures, different facilities allow you to draw blood cultures off central lines. I know when I was working in Chicago, when we did blood cultures, it was always a peripheral stick. We would never be allowed to use off central lines unless central line is freshly placed, like within, I want to say six to 12 hours or something like that. Otherwise it's peripheral because a lot of times when you get up culture, from like a central line sometimes it comes back to be positive but it's not necessarily you could say a bacteria that you have to be really concerned about because it's in a foreign object so there is tends tend to have not only like cloud formation but but also some bacterial growth obviously if it's a dangerous bacteria then you should definitely pull that line but sometimes the bacteria isn't really in the in, in your body it's actually just you could say around the cap so when you pull blood, blood culture, sometimes people don't clean the, the hub very off, uh, very well and they're pulling off the hub and there's bacteria growth around the hub itself and you're actually pulling dead bacteria with the blood. So it's like almost like a false positive, you yep. could say. But you have to be careful because that means there's bacteria on the, on the hub, which means that if you flush, you have a chance of flushing that bacteria into the blood causing sepsis. Yeah. Another complication that you might have is phlebitis, and that is literally, you can say, irritation and inflammation of the vein that it, that has the central catheter. And that's usually going to see like redness along the vein. So it's pretty interesting. I saw it once in my life, and it was just, you saw the inflamed vein, and literally where the central line was placed, there was redness all all through that, that, that vein, up until like almost by the armpit. So there was like a solid, like, I want to say, four to five inches of just a red line, you can literally follow that vein. And I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. We have, we, have to, we have to pull it, of course. But yeah, you should definitely look out for that. You'll definitely see it. This is something that is visually going to be there. But we also forgot to, to mention with the, with the sepsis, if, if there is drainage around, I'm not sure if you mentioned it or not, but if there is drainage around the insertion site, that definitely has to be cultured and for yeah. sure pulled because that's going to lead to an infection if, if an infection isn't already occurring. And that's just, that comes with good nursing judgment. And when you're doing your dressing change, taking a look, seeing how that site looks, does it look clean? Is it crusty? Drainage, just like you mentioned. And, you know, that goes that goes with maintenance mm. as to making sure that central line doesn't have a collapse because that's the biggest reason why we have so many issues in hospital where the hospital has to pay for it if it's a collapse. And ultimately, that's what takes a patient from getting better to, hey, going from, I want to say almost getting discharged to potentially going into seps and being admitted to the ICU mm -hmm. for an infection. Yeah. And then one thing we've also forgot to mention for the complications is thrombus formation. We mentioned it a little bit, but just like with any foreign object in your body, if it's not made by your body, then your body is going to see it as foreign. So sometimes there is a little bit of a cloud formation on there. And usually it's okay. Sometimes you, you'll feel it when you flush, you get resistance and you flush real, real hard. And you know, if you say you're kind of clearing that, that clot, but usually that clot's small and your body's able to, to basically break it down. But some people are more susceptible to clotting and you know, these clots get bigger. You could lead to like an embolism. So you have to also be careful for that. You have to be mindful of that, that, that if it's hard to flush, let somebody know, maybe you shouldn't always hard flush it, right? right. Because if it's like a big clot and someone's, prone to, to blood coagulation, then you don't want to hard flush it. I've, I've, hard, I've hard flush lines in the past. I haven't had any issues with them, but I would say still be careful because you don't want to dislodge that, that, that clot. You know, and sometimes if it could be scary because let's say you have this catheter, let's say pushing on a, on a vena cava, it's supposed to be like inside in, in the middle of, of the vessel, but sometimes it does, does get pushed on the wall. That could form a clot on a catheter and then also on the vena cava, and you're also causing trauma, which could form another clot, and that could lead to an actual big embolism, an actual yeah. problem. So that's why it's important to maintain these mm -hmm. lines. And it goes with simple as, and this is a pet peeve of mine, flush your lines every single shift. 
if not twice a shift. Make sure that thing is panned. It needs to be constantly lubricated because it's going to clot up. Uh, sometimes you can tell when a nurse doesn't flush it uh, bef- with a previous shift because you can tell the resistance. Mm-hmm. One way I like to flush my lines is I don't. I do like a pulsating flush with my 10 cc syringe. So instead of just flushing it continuously, I do like a flush stop, flush stop, flush stop, mm-hmm. and that kind of helps get rid of things. Um, and if you go and get into complication, just like you say, where the the line is clotted. Mm-hmm. We're going to go on the route, call pharmacy. And usually this is per protocol. I don't need to get a doctor's order where I'm going to order Adipase. Mm. Uh, Adipase comes in two little vials. You mix some water together. I think it's usually a total of three cc's. Of course, look at your guidelines for procedures there. Uh, You'll usually flush it, hold it for some time. I think half an hour to an hour is standard. You pull back. If you still don't see any blood, you wait a little bit longer and then go from there. Sometimes you might need two doses of added paste before the line gets clotted. Sometimes you can't save the line at all and you don't use it for uh, for medications. Mm. But it becomes a real problem where you have a bunch of pressers running and now you don't have a, the third lumen access to pull back blood. And it just, it just gets annoying because you got to stop all your drips and all that just to kind of get some blood. Yeah. And you have to also be careful on, on central lines because... Some of these central lines only have one exit point, which means if you have two or three lumens, one of, they might all just go into one lumen, right? So you have to be careful with mixing those kind of meds because there is lines like that. Majority of central lines that I've worked with, let's say they're, tri- they're a triple lumen, they usually have three different exit points. So you're n- not mixing any of those medications that you're infusing over there. You also want to make sure you get an x-ray after the central line is placed just to verify placement. You don't have to get it every shift. Like I know for a lot of times if someone's vented and intubated, they require a daily x-ray just to kind of evaluate the lungs and just to see if you got to change the ventilator settings and to make sure the ET tube is in the right place. But for this, you don't have to always get, get lines, you know, because they're sutured in and, and stuff. So you, it, it shouldn't, it should not, it should not move. And if it does move, you never want to push it back in. You could pull it back, but never push it in because remember everything outside the body is considered dirty. If it comes out, it should stay out. Because if you're going to push it back in, then you're in high risk for, for sepsis. Very good point. Yeah. With the dressing changes, some hospitals do it weekly. Some hospitals do it every 72 hours. Just adhere to your hospital policy. But of course, there's always that PRN dressing change where if it's soiled or if it's you know leaking or something's iffy, it's going out or you're trying to find a source of infection, maybe just open it up, take a look at it. Is it red? And then change the dressing. And of course, it's done in a, in a sterile fashion. Yeah. Switch all those lumens. And one interesting thing that took me a while to understand is if you have a peripheral line and you had a bunch of medications running and now you're converting to the central line after you have your x-ray confirmed, you have to get brand new tubing for everything Mm -hmm. because there's a risk for infections and all that. You want fresh tubing for everything. So one of those downfalls of an ICU nurse is when you get a central line in, it's awesome, but you got to retube everything. Mm -hmm. And if you have those catheters that have the little clamps, those require heparin flushes to maintain patency. And the one thing that I like doing to maintain patency because it's a pain in the ass when these catheters clot is just run a KVO at like five mLs an hour or 10 mLs an hour. You know, it's not gonna do them a lot of harm, even if they're heart failure and fluid overload, 10 mLs an hour or five mLs an hour to an adult running is not gonna do do a whole lot. Did you say flush heparin? Yeah. So oh, you can have heparin in the lumen if they're the lock one. You know how you sometimes you have those those things that you press down? You know what I'm talking about? No, I'm not right now. I'm so you not. have a pick line. And you know how some pick lines have a little adapter that you lock it, clamp it so you can't flush it? Oh, the one in the middle. You yeah, should, okay. you know how peripherals have that same thing? Where yes, you clamp yes. It? Yeah, sometimes those, so if you have those, those require heparin. And some lines don't because they have certain certain pressure which prevents uh, from clot formation. Okay, interesting. Yeah. I've never mm-hmm. never had to do that, so I'm yeah. asking. Okay. And it's also recommended to use a 10 ml syringe when you're working with central lines because according to manufacturer standards, they've that's the correct amount of pressure that's allowed to go through with the central lines. I've used 5cc syringes and 3cc syringes before. Just don't be super aggressive with them. I haven't had anything happen negatively into my patients. Yeah. But just be careful, you know? And of course, don't take a blood pressure on that arm. If they have a pick line in their left arm, you don't want it to have the cuff on their left arm. Put it on, on the right arm. 
Yeah, one, one thing I noticed with facilities too is nurses being lazy when there's blood draws. The patient has a pick line and they'll still do like some kind of lab calls or whatever. Mm. Just have the audacity the patient has a pick so they don't get poked. Make sure they get lab drawn to preventing them from getting uh, poked. Yeah. And, al and also, some facilities will be different uh, on central line. So, for example, the gold standard is usually like the IJs. Mm. I know s some ERs and physicians have a hard time. They go into the femoral artery, femoral vein. <laughs> Just about to say A-line here. <laughs> um, so when it comes to femoral veins, there's risk for infection. One hospital I worked at, we had 24 hours to remove that line. Mm -hmm. So if, if they came in in the ER femoral, that ICU doc has responsibility to change that. Mm -hmm. When I worked in California, we just left them in like they were with they didn't you know care for it as much so every facility will be different when it comes to that yeah i know at my hospital in chicago we always wanted to get rid of the femoral lines but we always try to place a central line somewhere else first before we pull the line because if you pull the line and then you can't get access then you're kind of screwed yeah but obviously it's femoral route is the dirtiest route and one more thing about dressing changes if you change dressings too frequently you're also causing a higher chance of infection because remember every time you open up that that dressing you're losing that, that sterility so don't be that nurse that changes them just for fun because you could also cause infections by changing too much dressings yeah, you know it what should be done when needed you know it also sucks you get a central line on tuesday mm -hmm. and wednesday's dressing change day and you have to change the dressing when it was just placed a day ago yeah. That, 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 that's risk for infection. I always think that's ass backwards when it comes to protocol, but we want to maintain everything on Wednesdays just so things are flowing. Yeah. So we do that for that reason. It's a process. And I looked up some, some few stats and according to healthpeople.gov, the most common hospital acquired infections are one is from catheter associated urinary tract infections. Number two is surgical site infections. Number three is bloodstream infections Four pneumonia and five C. diff. So Sometimes your blood treatment infection, which is number number three, are going to be due to your central lines. Same with the surgical site infections too, because surgical site infections also goes with like invasive procedures as well. And if you go down to IR, while insertion, you, you, you could cause that patient to have an infection because of the way you placed it. So just be mindful of that because there's, there's thousands of people that get septic from central lines a year, which then leads to millions of dollars being put toward, towards healthcare. And we're always trying to figure out a process and ways to avoid collapses and cauties. Those are the, one of the two main things that, that we kind of see in the hospital. Yep. Mm -hmm. I really like this podcast episode. I yeah. feel like I had a re-education on central lines for when I start my next travel nursing contract. Yeah. It was nice. Nice going over them because you get used to just doing the process and not really looking at, like you, you could say the theory behind it because you have your own process. You don't really... Pay attention to what kind of a pick it is, what kind of a brand, what kind of a lumen is it, is it a clamp or not. And, you know, this was very refreshing, yeah. Likewise, man. Great talking to you as always. Yep. See you next All right. Time. Hope you guys enjoyed this podcast episode. See you guys in the next one. Bye-bye. <laughs> cut it I short. Guess.